Uh, today's message is a game changer, and I've been praying all week for myself and praying for you because we're in this series called Extravagant, and we're talking about the echo of worship. And today we're looking at worship as we see it in the showdown on Mount Carmel. Now, some of you know what that's about because you've been around church. Others of you, you're not going to believe this moment that we're going to be able to peek into in the pages of God's Word. The title of this message today is Fresh Wind, Fresh Fire. Can you say that with me? Fresh Wind, Fresh Fire. That's what we're all about in our lives. And maybe for you... If you're honest, you're in a season of your life as a believer where you really need fresh wind. You're in a season of life, and not somebody who doesn't know about faith, not sure about who Jesus is, but as a believer, you're in a season of your life where you need fresh fire in your life. You can say that a lot of different ways. You need a touch from God. You you need God to show up in your life in a powerful way. You need the joy of your salvation that you had at the first all over again in your life. You need a new level of consecration, of devotion, of intimacy with God. And that's exactly what we see as the backdrop when we turn to 1 Kings 18. The very first verse of 1 Kings 18, setting up the story of the showdown of Mount Carmel says this, and after a long time in the third year, the word of the Lord came to Elijah. So somebody here can identify with that. Long time, third year. It's been a while. It's been a while since I've sensed God. It's been a while since I've sensed the Spirit. It's been a while since I knew I was moving in power. It's been a while since I knew I was in God's plan. It's been a while since I looked in the mirror and said, I can see supernatural happening in my life. So it had been a while, it had been a long time, and it was three years in when the word of the Lord came to the prophet Elijah. This is the message today. It may have been a long time, it may have been three years, it may have been 30 years, but the word of the Lord is coming to you today. And if nobody claps for that, I'm going to just have to preach on anyway. But what I'm trying to say today is that God is in the midst of us today. And I'm not Elijah, but I am a man with a voice, and the Word of God is still the Word of God. And it's coming to you today. It may have been a long time for you. It may be in the third year for you. It may have never happened for you, but the Word of the Lord is coming today. And this is what he said. He said, go and present yourself to Ahab. We're going to figure out all about who Ahab is. And I will send rain on the land. And the backdrop of this story today is a drought in all of the land. So we're three years in to no rain. We're three years in to crops who are, that are withering. We're three years in to people rationing their water. We're three years in to the prayer for a miracle from God. We need showers. We need a downpour. We need rain in our lives. And I'm just asking at the very beginning today, is anybody in that place today? I'm in a drought. I'm in a barren place in my life. I need showers from heaven to fall into the soil of my life. And if that's you, today is your day. What was the showdown on Mount Carmel? Give you the postage stamp, and then we're going to unpack it. In this moment, Israel had turned their back on God. Ahab was the king, and he was a wicked king. They were serving idols, the idols of the people around them. But there was a voice, Elijah, and speaking on behalf of God, he goes to Ahab, the king, and says, bring all of your prophets and meet me at Mount Carmel. So 850 prophets show up with Ahab, 450 prophets of the god Baal, 400 prophets of the goddess Asherah. And so 850 prophets show up and there's one man of God, Elijah, and he throws down the challenge. He says, build two altars and get two bulls. And you put one bull on your altar, you call on your God, and I'm going to put a bull on my altar and I'm going to call on Yahweh, the one true God, and we'll see what happens here today on Mount Carmel. As you read the text all afternoon, 
The prophets of Baal and Asherah go first and call on their God and nothing happens. And Elijah has a little bit of a a moment in the flesh, sort of spirit in the flesh, and he says, well, maybe he's asleep. Maybe he went on a trip. Maybe uh, he's out of town. Maybe he's hard of hearing. Maybe you should call louder. Cry a little bit louder, and they do. They cry louder and louder and louder and louder, but all afternoon long, their sacrifice sits on the wood. And finally, it's Elijah's turn, and he prays, and he says, dear God in heaven, Let it be known today that you are the God of heaven and you are the God of earth. In other words, he was saying, God, get glory right now in the face of 850 prophets of Baal. And fire fell from heaven. It burned up the sacrifice. It burned up the altar. It burned the ground. It burned everything and scorched earth in that spot. And in that moment, people knew there is one true God and his name is Jehovah God. He is Yahweh God. He's the one who was and is and is to come. Fire (laughs) fell on the mountain. And I just believe that the the story for a lot of us is today, I want that. I want fire to fall in my life. I do not want to just go through the motions of Christianity, show up at church, read my Bible, have my daily devotional plan, do my soap with my friend, do my version Bible plan, and basically have my life look exactly like it looked six months ago, six years ago. I want fresh wind, and I want fresh fire in my life. And if that's you today, pay close attention as we unpack because there is a way for you to experience the fresh fire and to experience the fresh wind of God today in your life. Same as what happened on Mount Carmel. The first thing I want you to see about this story is the climate. We have to unpack a little bit what the climate is in this moment. And basically, the climate in a nutshell is that the people of God have become infatuated with the idols of their world. In other words, when they started the journey, God delivered them out of Egypt. But now that they're into the promised land, there are all these other idols of the nations and they're sort of mixing and matching and infatuated with the stories of some of the other gods. You see this in Deuteronomy chapter six because God already understands that this is gonna happen. And so he's trying to prepare them for the pathway to success. Can you allow me to say that again today? God is trying to prepare you for the best. So God led them out of Egypt and out of bondage into the promised land. And that's what he's trying to do for you. Now see, the world turns this around and says, no, God, if you follow him, wants to lead you out of the promised land and into bondage, out of more and into less. But God has always been leading his people out of less and into more, out of slavery and into freedom, out of bondage and into a place of abundance. And he wants to do that for you. So we've got to speak against the enemy right at the beginning of this message because a lot of us are sitting in a room honestly going, I don't know if I can trust God. I don't know if God has my best interest in his heart. I don't know if God really is wanting to lead me into a promised land. Why do you think that? Because the enemy is always turning this story around and convincing us somehow that full surrender to Jesus equals less in our lives and not more. And from the very beginning, God was putting all of his cards on the table. I'm gonna come down and deliver you. I'm gonna come down and part the sea. I'm gonna come down and set you free. I'm gonna come down and defeat your enemies. I'm gonna come down and lead you in to a land that already has vineyards, already has orchards, already has cities built for you to live in. You're gonna move into their cities. You're gonna live in their houses. You're gonna have their crops. You're gonna have their fields. You're gonna have their vineyards. I'm leading you into a finished work. But there are going to be a few challenges. And he tells us this right at the very beginning, Deuteronomy 6. 
When the Lord your God brings you into the land, he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to give you a land with large, flourishing cities you did not build, houses filled with all kind of good things you did not provide, wells you did not dig, vineyards and olive groves you did not plant. Then when you eat and are satisfied, be careful. Now, you would think that this line doesn't even need to be in the word of God. Be careful that you do not forget the Lord who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Now, come on, who could forget the Lord? Can you imagine people forgetting the Lord? Like he delivers them out and brings them in and they forget him. I can't imagine someone doing that. I don't know what was wrong with these people. Obviously, not like us. Verse 13. So fear the Lord your God, serve him only, And take your oaths in his name. Do not follow other gods, the gods of the peoples around you. For the Lord your God, who is among you, is a jealous God, and his anger will burn against you, and he will destroy you from the face of the land. Now all of a sudden, this wonderful delivering, salvation bringing, Freedom-speaking God sounds like, you know, Jennifer. I don't like it when you talk to him at work. I didn't like it when you sat with him at dinner. I'm not sure. I, I, who, who are you texting right now? And all of a sudden, we say this weird human jealousy sort of in the equation, and God isn't saying that at all. He's not saying, I'm jealous, and I really get all jacked up when you spend extra time with so-and-so and give them that look across the table. He's saying, I am the Lord. Do you understand that? There is no God but me. The way Isaiah said it, uh, my name is the Lord. I, I am the Lord, and that is my name. I will not share my glory with another or any of my praise with idols. This is God defending God. And it's a whole other sermon for another day, but it's in the root of who we are as passion and the passion movement. God is the defender of God. You're like, well, why does God have to defend God? Because you're surely not defending him. God is the promoter of the glory of God. Well, why does God have to promote the glory of God? Because if God didn't promote the glory of God, you wouldn't know about the glory of God. So the heavens declare his glory. Creation declares his glory. The cross declares his glory. His word declares his glory. And he declares his glory. And he says, I love you so much, you've got to understand this. Don't have any other gods but me. Don't have another god but me. Do not make an idol and do not worship it. First four of the Ten Commandments, all about him defending his glory. Why? Because he's this little bitty, you know, complex god who's like, oh, nobody likes me anymore. No, because he knows who he is and he knows the best thing for you is himself so he promotes himself for you and for me so that we can get the best because we're not smart enough to figure out in the vast array of gods which god to give our allegiance to and so he says hey i've set you free i brought you into a land i'm going to give you cities you didn't build i'm going to give you houses that you didn't prepare i'm going to give you wells you didn't dig vineyards you hadn't planted orchards that you had nothing to do with i'm going to bring you into a finished work called salvation and the grace and the love of god but here's the thing do not mess around with the gods of the peoples around you because that will be your end you see we're all concerned about did i step an inch over the line or did i go somewhere I wasn't supposed to go or did I say something I wasn't supposed to say because that's what God's all concerned about. Oh, trust me, it says in the next few verses, God is concerned. Please do not misunderstand me about how we live, about our conduct, about our reputation, about our character. But what God is most concerned about in your life today is your worship. Oh, I thought he was concerned about whether I quit smoking or not. Oh, I'm going to quit smoking. Because you know the Lord's all about smoking and dancing and the kind of music you listen to. And that's all God's really into, right? Wrong. What God is into is your 
worship. Because he knows when your worship is right, your life will be right. And if your life is right as a result of your worship, then you're going to have the right kind of heart in your life. You can change your behavior and never change your worship. And God is after your affection. He wants to open your eyes to see who he is. And in this climate, the people of God were infatuated with the idols of the world. I want you to see two texts because I want to give a little bioepic really quickly on Ahab. And I can't spend too much time on it, but you need to understand the landscape and where we are. So turn back two chapters to 1 Kings 16 and look what happens as we introduce Ahab in verse 29. In the 38th year of Asa, king of Judah, Ahab son of Omri became king of Israel and he reigned in Samaria over Israel 22 years. Ahab did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than any of those before him. He not only considered it trivial to commit the sins of Jeroboam, and you got to go back to the beginning, to the start of the kings of Israel to get Jeroboam. This guy was a terrible guy. And his sins have been passed on generationally and are all the way through all the kings of Israel. And along comes Ahab, and he doesn't think anything of just doing all the wicked things that Jeroboam did before him. And so that's the first thing that it says he did. But look what else. But he also married Jezebel daughter of Ethbaal. Now that should give you a hint right there of what the lineage is in Jezebel's life. Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians. And because he married Jezebel, track with me, he began to serve Baal and worship him. He set up an altar for Baal in the temple of Baal that he built in Samaria. So we're in the promised land. I'm the king of Israel and I'm going to build a temple to a Canaanite God and worship him in the promised land. Because I'm married into Jezebel who is a Yahweh hating Jehovah non-believing woman who came from a lineage of evil. Ahab also, if that's not enough, made an Asherah pole and did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger him than did all the kings of Israel before him. Baal, which means Lord, the word means Lord, was a God of sun and storm. A lot of times you would see him depicted, Baal, with a lightning bolt in his hand. He was the son of El and Asherah. Asherah was the feminine goddess of fertility. And it was thought that Baal had extraordinary powers to bring forth fertility, not only of crops, but also of offspring. And so El, which nobody really worshipped El, he was thought to be a passive god, but Asherah powerful, their son Baal, and Baal become, became one of the predominant gods of the day. If you want a mental picture for where we are, you can go to the Louvre, and there is a relief there of Baal. And we have an image of it for you today. It's 48 or so, 46, 48 inches tall. And Baal with the, the horned helmet on his head, he has a staff in his hand where he's touching the ground to make the crops grow. And he's got um, this lightning bolt coming out of the other hand. Another image we have of him from antiquity. So this is Baal. This is the God the king of Israel has married into. This is the God to whom Ahab built a temple in the promised land and said, we're going to worship that God. The Asherah pole uh, looks like this. And you, there would be an Asherah pole and a temple uh, of worship and a place of worship for Baal on every high place in Israel. So on every high mountain, on every sacred place, and Mount Carmel would have been one of the most sacred places, you would have found a, an idol to Baal and an Asherah pole and a king of the people of God who said, we're going to worship these 
gods. Now, this is a very short little cul-de-sac for someone today, but be very careful who you marry into. Ahab was already wicked. But when he married Jezebel, it went to another level. We read when we turn over to chapter 18 about these 850 prophets that all gathered at Mount Carmel. And look at what it says about them um, coming down. Looking for the verse in verse 19. Now summon the people from all over Israel to meet me on Mount Carmel. This is Elijah speaking, and bring the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. And so the word today for somebody is don't marry her. Do not marry him. Well, why not? Because he is anti-Jehovah and anti-Yahweh and anti-Jesus. Jezebel and Ahab not only were wicked, there's a plenty of wicked kings in Israel and Judah. In fact, almost all of the kings were wicked. Out of the 40 some odd kings, Only a handful of them does it not say they did evil in the sight of the Lord. And like their father, they did evil and they did not tear down the Asherah pole and the Baal in the high places. But Ahab and Jezebel had an especially evil pact. And Jezebel particularly at this moment in time has sought out and killed off all the prophets of the living God. Except Elijah. And some of you are listening today to an Old Testament story, but you're living in a present tense reflection of it right now. And if nothing else today, God is saying to you, get out and get away while you can. Get out and get away while you can. I don't believe in a God who would end a relationship Oh, I don't believe in God who wants me to cut off my dear friend who was with me when I went through my hard time in life and went through my struggle and they were right there with me. Cut them off and cut off the evil branch. Cut off the voice that is speaking against your love for Jesus and cut off the thinking that's stopping you from fully surrendering your life to the lordship and the kingship of Jesus Christ. Because guess what? Newsflash, you're about to become one flesh. And there is no division of territory after that. You are gonna be in it with the enemy. And if you believe God's going to save them, then I just want to say to you today, God bless your faith, and we will all pray with you about that. Cut them off, send them out. Let God save them, transform them, fill them with the Spirit, and send them on at least a seven-year mission project. And when they get back, then you can marry them. That's not the message today. So we would never end up worshiping a 48-inch idol, would we? With a weird hat? (laughs) Or or a, a pole carved out of a tree? Surely we would never become infatuated with the idols of our time. But they did. And when they did, God sent a call to them. Second thing I want you to see, and the call was the voice of Elijah. And the voice of Elijah was the only voice there could be, but he was courageous and he was willing. And he stepped up, sent a message, by the way, through uh, the, the man who was running Ahab's palace and said, hey, I know Ahab's been looking for me. Jezebel especially wants to take me out. Let him know that I'm here and I want to talk to him. And when they met, this is what he said to Ahab. He said, you assemble all your prophets and meet me at Mount Carmel. God brought a 
voice. And what I want you to know today, it doesn't matter where you are, how far away you are, or what odds are stacked against your relationship with God, or how many idols are in your story, God's still bringing you a voice today. He's still calling out to you today. And this is what the voice is always calling out. Look at what it says. And this is what the call was when it came through Elijah. So Ahab sent word, verse 20, throughout all Israel assembled the prophets on Mount Carmel. And Elijah went before the people and said, how long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. Does that sound familiar to anybody here? It rings a bell to me of the message to the church in Revelation. I'd rather you be hot or cold, but because you're lukewarm, I'm going to just spit you out of my mouth. Now, I used to struggle with that when I was in high school here and at a youth camp because every youth pastor at every youth camp preached on that passage. Amen? Did you go to that youth camp? And I would always sit on the fourth row and go, man, I mean, why would God rather me be cold? At least when you're warm, you're warm. I mean, you know, sometimes they say, well, she's still warm. I mean, that's good. I mean, warm's like means you're near hot. Warm like means you're near the fire. Warm means you're not frozen. Warm. Why would God rather you be cold than warm? The same reason Elijah stood on this mountain and said, let's get this straight today. If you believe that God is God, then completely and totally and extravagantly give him your life. If you think little Baal over here is God, then completely and totally and extravagantly give him your life. But stop going back and forth. Stop doing what we do. Man, we were in that meeting and I was so fired up and I felt a touch of the spirit and we were singing that song and everything was amazing and God answered our prayer and came through and the phone call and the deal and the whatever and it happened. Yeah! You been there? Anybody been there? Please, somebody? Two weeks later, you were having coffee with a friend. I don't know, I don't know. You don't know what? I don't know. I don't know where God is. I don't even know if there is a God. I don't know. I just, I'm like, I'm confused right now. And I'm, I just don't know. And I mean, I thought, but I'm not sure. And I don't know. And this happened and the thing happened and the circumstance and then whatever. And I don't even know if God knows about me, loves me, cares about me. And if I'm honest, can I be honest with you? Can I just be vulnerable and transparent right now? I don't even know if there is a God. And then you get that promotion at work that you were praying for. Your friend gets healed. Something happens and you're like, ah. God is amazing. Passion is amazing. I will go to the ends of the earth. I will follow you anywhere. I don't care what it costs me. I'm out with Jesus. And your friend says, I hate to say this, and I know that uh, you're going to think it's about you, but it's really about me. And we have had a great time together, but I think we're going to be way better friends than we were in a relationship because the whole time we've been in a relationship, we've been arguing and fighting and blah. Before that, we were friends. It was all great. That's why I'm going to end this today. (sighs) I don't know if there's a Lord (laughs) or a God coming to church. This is our church. This is the church. I love Jesus on Sunday, but man, Thursday, it got popping. Had to make some quick decisions. They weren't all great. Sunday, I'm all in. Last Saturday, I was partially out. (laughs) Sunday, there was a God, and then, whoo, he's cute and he likes me no one likes me right now but he's cute and he likes me oh you don't go to church oh you hate church oh that's okay that's okay we'll work on it it's no big deal no no, it's not it's not a huge issue right now we just met I mean let's hang out have a coffee or date for two or three years and then we'll talk about it you know and we're living in a culture We're so sure, and we're so unsure. 
And Elisha is just saying, look, man, it's time for somebody here today to make a decision. And if God is God, follow God. And if your idol is God, follow your idol. And here's what he's saying to you today. And I know it sounds kind of crazy and confusing, but he's saying, look, I would rather you 1,000% commit to your idol than 47% commit to me. You're like, why would God want me to 1,000% commit to an idol that he knows is an idol? Because the sooner you commit 1,000% to that idol and quit playing games with yourself, you will get to empty a lot faster that way. You'll get to empty way faster by going a thousand miles an hour after your idol than coming in here and going, I feel good. I feel like I love the Lord. Ooh, I don't know about today, but I did. Oh, I, oh, no, I love the Lord. I absolutely got one hand up in worship and I've got one hand over here holding on to my idol and you don't really even know who you are and you, don't, you wonder why there's no fire on your altar and no fresh wind in your heart and God is saying, I'll tell you why. It's because you haven't made a decision yet and the call of God is coming coming to your life today. Listen, if Jesus is alive from the dead, follow him. If your idol is going to get you what you want, follow your idol. Just make a decision, write a blog, tweet about it and post about it and let us all know and stop wavering back and forth between two opinions. Have you seen enough? Have you heard enough to know that your feet are on a cornerstone named Jesus? Have you been through enough and seen God do enough to know that no matter what the circumstance, the situation, the climate that's around me, the worship that's going to happen around me, the idols that around me. I am standing on solid ground and my God is enough. And I'm going to choose to worship him. The call came and then there was a clarification. What is the clarification? The clarification is when God shows up and answers the question. Is it Baal or is it me? I'm about to clarify that. fire falls. And God wants to clarify that for you. He wants to answer for you the question, is God real? Is God powerful? Can God come through and will he come through? He wants to answer it for the world that's watching you. Oh, you say you're a believer. You say you trusted the Lord. You say you put your faith in Jesus, but we can't really tell what's going on. God wants to clarify a couple of things. He wants to clarify, one, that he is God, in fact, in the heavens and in the earth, and he wants to make his name famous in your life. But he's also clarifying something beautiful today, and it is this. What did the fire fall on? We see it right in the text. At the end of the prayer of Elijah, it says in verse 38, then the fire of the Lord fell. 1 Kings 18, 38. And say it with me. And burned up the sacrifice. Yes, and the wood and yes, and the stones, and yes, and the soil, and also licked up the water in the trench. Well, what was that about? Well, Elijah wanted there to be no doubt. So they prayed, put their bull on the altar, prayed, cut themselves, cried out to heavens, were hysterical all day long. Nothing happened. Elijah said, before we do my thing, put the bull on there, but get jars of water and drench the sacrifice, the wood, and the altar. In fact, dig a trench around the altar and fill it up with water. They did that. He said, great, do it a second time. They did it a second time. Great, do it a third time. They did it a third time. So we've got soaked bull, soaked wood, soaked altar, and a trench of water all around the altar. The fire comes down, immediately burns up the sacrifice and everything else. And what God is wanting to say today is that he wants to show himself strong in your life. He wants to show himself as the one true God in your story, but he can't bring fire unless there's a sacrifice. This is the key word of our series. All worship involves sacrifice. And please understand me, the fire's not going to fall on your 365-day devotional reading. 
The fire's gonna fall when you put something on the altar. So what was the sacrifice then? Good question. Certainly it wasn't the bull, they had a bull. When the wood, they had wood. It wasn't an altar, they had an altar. What was it? Well, some people say it was the water because we're in a drought, right? And to pour water on this is to say we're pouring our very livelihood on it. We're, we're basically you know, taking the most precious possession we have and we're pouring it on this sacrifice and that was true. But I think the water was partially about showing God how serious Elijah was and partially about just making sure that it's like there's no hidden agenda here. There's no like sparks underneath. There's no like hocus pocus gonna happen here. We've drenched everything. The only way this baby's coming alive is, is if the fire comes down from heaven in a massive way and consumes it. So if it wasn't the bull, the wood, the stones, and ultimately it wasn't simply the water, what was the sacrifice, are you ready? The sacrifice was faith. Yeah. Hebrews eleven six. without faith, it is impossible to please God. And you know what Elijah was saying? He was saying, there's no plan B or C. There is no backup. In fact, there's no going back. Either fire's gonna fall from heaven and God's gonna be glorified that way or I'm gonna be killed and I'm gonna see Jehovah today. Jehovah's gonna win the day in my heart one way or the other, but it's gonna be through fire or by death. There is no escaping for me. There's no backup plan. There's no other way out. This faith is me saying all my hope is in Jesus. And that's an extravagant sacrifice that grabs the attention of heaven. I've been reading about the lunar landing coming up on the 50th anniversary in just a few days now. 1969, Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin landed the lunar module on the surface of the moon. Now this is real, by the way, and if you're one of those conspiracy theorists who doesn't believe we went to the moon, then God bless you, but this is probably not the right church for you. <laughs> Just panning around. I've researched, there are several churches in the metro Atlanta area who do not believe in the lunar landing. They'll be happy to receive you. We can transfer your letters straight over. It'll be easy. In reading one of the many, many accounts I've read of the lunar landing in a book called A Man on the Moon recently, just a few weeks ago, it was talking about that moment where now the lunar module was in powered descent. Buzz Aldrin is reading the data, Neil Armstrong's flying the lunar module by the seat of his pants. He's looking out a small window, operating a little toggle switch and a joy switch, within, which in no way resembles the controls that he's used his entire life as a fighter pilot. The radar is jammed and there is no usable information about where they're landing except what he sees out the window. Their power supply is dwindling. They have seconds to put this baby on the ground and they'd entered something that I recently learned was called the dead man's curve. You know what the dead man's curve was? It was the moment they knew that they couldn't hit the abort switch and fire the other set of rockets and rejoin Columbia, orbiting the moon. The forces of gravity of the lunar surface, their speed of descent and their altitude now put them in the dead man's curve. And like it or not, for better or worse, they were landing on the surface of the moon very soon. And that's where Elijah was when he went to Mount Carmel. He was in dead man's curve. I believe 
that you are the one true God and I believe your name is worth defending and I will defend your name and I will either die here today or fire will come down on the mountain. Those are the only two options that are gonna happen to your servant today. I am in the dead man's curve. I am a dead man walking and I believe in faith that my God is gonna come through. And if you don't come through, there ain't gonna be no coming through today because I don't have a backup plan. I just have faith today that you are going to come through in my life. I'm not talking about irresponsibility where your wise counsel said don't do it. Your parents told you it's a bad idea. Your three friends over coffee told you this is not a good move for you. The word of God didn't affirm it and you did it anyway because I'm a person of faith. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about wise counsel did say take the step. Your, your godly friends did say take the step. The word of God did say take the step and you said you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to take the step. I don't have another plan. I don't have an ace in my, in my pocket. I don't have any backup here. I'm going to take the step and trust God and believe God and God then is going to clarify you are my daughter, you are my son. Your faith has been answered. Heaven has seen your faith and applauded your faith and I'm gonna come through for you. And we don't have time to unpack it, but the last of these little stories inside this is the cloud. There was the climate, there was the call, there was the clarifying power of God and then there was the cloud. I mean, the prophets of Baal, they all got extinguished as soon as the fire came down. Everybody's like, we believe, we believe. And they're like, yeah, I know you believe, but it's too late for you. They all got wiped out. Ahab got off the hook for a short period of time. You know what Elijah told him? He said, you better get ready, a downpour is coming. In fact, you better get in your chariot and head on back to Jezreel because there's going to be such a gully washer come through here. You'll get stuck over on the side of the road in your chariot, so you better get on going home, boy, because a downpour is coming. Did it look like rain? No. Were there thunderclouds overhead? No. Did the wind change and the breeze was moving in? No. Elijah just is fired up right now. He's just seen fire come down on the mountain. He's just seen God answer faith. And he said, and I believe my God who sent me here with a word, who said, this is the word of the Lord in, a, in the third year after a long, time there's going to be rain then there's going to be rain and I don't see any rain but I believe God said at the beginning of this whole thing there's going to be rain so Ahab get on going home because there's going to be rain here and then Elijah went up to the top of Mount Carmel sent his servant to look toward the Mediterranean he looked to the Mediterranean sea saw nothing came back don't see anything go look again don't see anything go look again don't see anything go look again don't see anything the seventh time he went to look he came back and he said Elijah you're not going to believe it but there's a little tiny cloud in the sky way over the Mediterranean. It looks about the size of my fist. And Elisha said, that's it. That's it. That's the seed. That's God at work. God is going to answer what God said God was going to do. And that little cloud got closer and closer and closer until an absolute drought breaker happened in that land. And then the Spirit of God, this is my favorite part. You talking about just enjoying the Bible. The Spirit of God came on Elisha Elijah, and he started running to Jezreel. No chariot. Ahab's got a big old head start. And he outruns Ahab and his chariot to Jezreel. Can you imagine a moment where he pulls up next to him jogging? Hey, what's up, man? I told you it was going to rain. I told you we were getting a downpour. I told you that my God is the God of heaven and the God of earth. I'll see you later. And off he goes to Jezreel, running the Mount Carmel Marathon in the power of the Holy Spirit. Don't you want some kind of new power? Don't you want at some moment to go, whoa, I've never done this before. And don't you want your drought broken? How long's it been since rain fell in your heart and fire fell on your life and wind picked up your sails? Well, I want to promise you today it's not about trying harder or running faster. It's about where you're kneeling down and who you're worshiping. 
And if I can be so bold, some of you want to know why there's not fire on your mountain, and I'll tell you why. It's because Baal is in your back pocket. And you will not get fire on the altar of your heart as long as you're harboring a love affair with the gods of this world. And the Holy Spirit is speaking a thousand different languages right now. And he is being so specific because the call and the word of the Lord never come to you and me in some generalized sense. They always come. This relationship, that's where your hope is. It's got to go. You got to put faith in me that I've got a plan for you. And I know it looks like if you say goodbye to him, then that's saying goodbye to your one shot. But trust me, he's not your one shot. I'm your one shot. And if you'll believe in me again, trust in me again, put faith in me again today and obey me again today, I'll come through for you. I think it's time for us to maybe turn back the clock. You know, the old summer camps, whew, we all lived through them. Anybody lived through summer camp? I know they were great. They were great. They were amazing. Anybody ever have the one that had the big bonfire at the end of the week? And they, everybody uh, got, went and got their old bad CDs from their backpack or suitcase in the cabin and brought them to the bonfire and threw their ACDC in the fire, <laughs> threw all their Rush CDs in the fire. All the metal heads, you know, going in the fire. All the Satan music going in the fire. Anybody, was anybody at that camp? Nobody was at that camp? You were at the camp? It's a very awkward camp because you're over here like the, the, the God is God. I will follow him. The Lord is God. <laughs> and then two weeks later, you're over at the used CD store trying to buy back different versions of all the CDs that you've thrown in the fire because you're really uh, missing your soundtrack. And I, I'm not necessarily purporting that we get back to like a heavy duty rededication, I'm gonna try harder mentality. It really didn't take for most of us who tried it a hundred times. But there's gotta be something today that you need to throw in the fire. We talk about revival. But revival is the easiest gospel equation there is. It's not mystical. It's not like looking for a needle in a haystack. Revival will happen the instant that you throw everything but Jesus, your allegiance to everything that you have clung to and put your hope in and thought you couldn't live without but Jesus. You throw it in the fire and put it on the altar and the spirit of God and the applause of heaven will fall on you. In that moment, revival will happen in your heart. And I'm telling you, I think the Lord is weary of a generation saying, we want revival. And he's like, get bail out of your back pocket and I'll give you revival. Cut down the Asherah pole and cease with your infatuation with the gods of this world. Rekindle a love affair for the one true God who sets you free and leads you out of slavery into a promised land. And I will bring down fire from heaven and I will set you on fire. And that is revival.